Welcome. This is awesome. This is what? Equinox? We're here on the Equinox. I couldn't imagine a finer thing to do. Talk about permaculture and farming and caring for the land. We have a lot to cover today. We don't have a lot of time. I think, you know, I'll try to limit my talk to maybe two hours and we, we can have a quick break and Rocco could speak. And then after Rocco speaks, we're going to go walk across the street and we'll do a demo. So it's going to be really cool. So basically everything for me, and I really just want to kind of like dial this in. I really want you guys to get into the way I think in the way I don't necessarily think everybody should think like this, but I think it would be helpful to think like a designer, to think like we have potential to have a design revolution for everything we do. And when you're a permaculturalist, you're synthesizing so much information. You walk out on a piece of land and there's many different layers to it. So sometimes, you know, I'll go out on a piece of land and I'll do a consultation. And I really won't say much because I'm just synthesizing information and you're working with all these different layers from the basic needs of the client, you know, to what your vision is, to what you hope for the client could grow into, to what the land could carry, you know. So permaculture is like a really, it's a creative way of being, it's a creative way of thinking. So that's kind of what we'll explore is a little bit of the mindset behind permaculture and how that lends itself to, you know, the, the real overall arching goal of the day is to talk about pasture management and integrating permaculture with that. But, you know, I can't really do that without giving you guys a little background about permaculture and how, you know, how I think. So, this is so important, growing it, growing your fertility. I think this is really, you know, the three points. There's one more I want to talk about ponds a little bit and the free nutrients we can get from ponds. But these are basically three of the big points. And permaculture is a system which lets us analyze land and it kind of gives us this like broad frame of reference to where we understand how to work with different elements. And then we can start bringing in um, different methodologies. So I'm going to talk a little bit about biodynamics. You know, I'm just going to touch on all this. We don't have a whole lot of time, so I can't go into too much depth on all of it. I'm going to talk a little bit about Korean natural farming and compost tea. And all three of these, basically you're culturing your organisms off the land. You're growing them out and you're able to spray them out. So for basically free, you're getting on-farm fertility. And I think, you know, that's really the future of farming. Over the past 50 years or so, we've, got, we've, we've really brought all our nutrients in on the farm, you know, broad scale. You know, we bring our fertilizers in, we bring our feed in, we bring everything in. But before that, you know, we had to produce it on the piece of land. And I think the future is going to look more like that. We're going to be producing our own fertility on the piece of land. The prime directive of permaculture, it's really a methodology of self, of self-awareness and giving yourself a basis to work off of. So you have that base and then you can start adding layers. And that starts with the farmer, really. I mean, the farmer is the one making the decisions on the land. The farmer, you know, benefits from having a blueprint to go off of. So that's kind of what permaculture is, is a blueprint. So the prime directive of permaculture is ethics, is to make ethical decisions. And being a farmer, being a homesteader, is really about personal responsibility. We've all said that it's much healthier to grow it. We've made that choice. You know, so we're taking personal responsibility. We're taking responsibility for our land. We're taking responsibility for ourselves and our family. So I think that that's really the prime directive. 
It's about self-responsibility. And it's about this upward spiraling evolution. So it's creative upwardness. It's thinking outside the box. It's realizing there's many different answers to many different problems. There's solutions to everything. But it's getting creative with it. And it's, it's like if you can get in that creative spirit and even if you can't implement every creative idea, and maybe it just doesn't even make sense to implement every creative idea you have, but to be able to give yourself freedom to go down those paths, to start thinking about it, to looping it in, and to really start stacking systems, start getting creative w with the way we think about things. So basically, it's time to do it, you know. Make it now. So it's about care of the earth, obviously. That includes all living and non-living things, animal, plants, land, water, and air. It's care of people. So basically, those are the same things. You know, we take care of people, we're going to take care of the earth. We take care of the earth, we're going to take care of the people. And it's about self-reliance. And then the one that I think, especially in our society, in this day and age, that we could all work on is the principle of cooperation. Cooperation really means that there's more for everybody. I think we're used to, in this capitalism society, to you know, going toe to toe with people and we're all trying to get our own, but cooperation, if we can cooperate, then there's gonna be more. And I've seen this time and time again. If you have just that, and this goes back to me, or the permaculturalist, or the farmer. If I have that attitude of cooperating, I get so much more out of life. You know, I'll do anything for anybody. And not that I'm doing it so I'll get something in return, but that's just the way it works. When you start cooperating, all doors open. Everything is possible. So we go down this road of permaculture design, and we have a blueprint to go by. These are things that we could take or not take, but for a lot of us, we didn't grow up on a farm. A lot of us may have grown up in the city. We may not had this blueprint to go off of, and permaculture kind of gives us that basis. So the rule of necessity is leaving the nature, natural system alone until we need it, basically, or we're forced to use it. There's a rule of conservation. It just makes so much sense. Reduce waste. If you reduce waste, you reduce pollution. You design in efficiency. And then care for surviving natural assemblies. That's very important. Care for nature as it is. You know, we don't need to develop every aspect of the farm. There's places that are better off being natural and in that natural state. And obviously, we can rehabilitate degraded or eroded land. We can feel good about that. And that's something to do and always to work towards. And then uh, create our own complex living environment. And that's when you start implementing a permaculture design on your land, that's what you're doing. You're creating complexity, not just for complexity's sake, but when you start installing systems, you start adding complexity. And if you can install a system, permaculture system and just kind of stand back and let nature start to take over, then it's going to reveal so many secrets. It's going to start, a whole process will unlock. This is really like where the rubber hits the road for me. This is really, you know, the first part is eth ethics. It's kind of getting our inner system aligned. But the methodologies of design, is really important. So this is kind of, when we work on a design, we have these different methodologies that we can go by. You know, like it says, permaculture is made up of techniques and strategies. A technique is just how to do something. A strategy is the how with the timing aspect. So that's critical in farming. It's always timing. Timing is everything. Timing is like short little windows when there's an opportunity to do something. So you're, 
you're mixing these techniques with strategies. But, you know, permaculture is really, I think, a way of life. Like, it's, there's some techniques that we could teach and strategies and things like that. But I think it's just, it's just a way of being a way of life. So, you know, when we're designing something, the first thing we want to do, like I talked about, is you'll go onto a piece of property and you'll just observe. And that observation, depending upon how complex the land is, the land forms, the climate, you know, you may be able to walk onto a simple piece of land that's flattish, open, and you could pretty much um, put your gaze over the piece of land. It could be 50 acres if it's open and flat, and you could pretty much observe and take it in pretty quickly. You could have a small parcel that's incredibly complicated, and it could take years to get to know it. I'm always observing, always looking. And it can take so long to actually kind of get the download. And the download is, I think, when everything just kind of clicks and you see the potential of a piece of land. And you don't want to rush that. I think a lot of us just want to, you know, we want to move forward. We want time is of the essence. But we don't necessarily spend enough time observing to make the right choices. So just taking that time to observe is, is so important. Uh, scale of permanence is kind of, you're working with design. You kind of start with the things that are already there. So the most permanent things on a piece of land are usually the buildings, you know, the road, the infrastructure things like that, so you have to take that into account when you're trying to design a piece of land. The zones, zones are really simple, but it's a great way of designing your land. It's zone zero is basically your house, your kitchen, what's inside. That's where you are all the time. You step out your front door, what's right around you, where you can see that's zone one. You know, you wanna put things in zone one that need tending every day. Um, or picking every day. You know, you could put the herb garden, you could put the lettuce, you know, the kitchen garden, that kind of thing. You could put quiet animals there, you know, and you're kind of like thinking in zones and you can work your way out. So you wouldn't want to put, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want to put roosters in zone one or chickens and roosters, you know, because they're loud. Zone two, that works your way out just a little bit, you can do that. The zones interweave a little bit. So I'd say maybe chickens are zone two. You, st you go there every day, but you don't spend a lot of time there every day. But you don't want to put chickens in like zone four or five where you're having to travel, you know, a quarter mile or say 300 feet or whatever, because if you do the math in that over a year, you know, that's a lot of travel time. So anything you can bring close, but improve the quality and kind of the impact of it. So it's, it's close, but it's not, it's not waking you up necessarily first thing in the morning, or you're not smelling the, the chickens or, you know, things like that. So it, it's kind of like a interesting mix there, what is in the zones. But like grazing systems or, you know, a lot of people have dairy animals you know, you'll move your dairy animals from a further out zone, maybe three or four, closer in, maybe even to zone one. A lot of people, and especially back in the day, up north, um, you would see these massive kind of barn house structures with a courtyard, and it was very cold, and the animals lived in the barn and the people were connected to it. And so that's like, you know, that was right there in that zone one. And that makes a lot of sense for that climate. So it's, you know, I think it, it, it just depends on the piece of land and it really depends on like your needs and how efficient you can get it. So sector analysis, that's, um, Without doing a blackboard drawing, it's kind of hard to explain, but sector is basically, if you were to stand on any piece of your land that you're trying to design, say it's your house, 
you're going to look out and the sectors are basically like pies or you could think of it like energy coming in like arrows shooting in so you may have like a wind sector where the wind blows in so that you could have a windmill or you could have you could orientate your doors towards that so you can open it in the summer or you may want to put up trees to block that to do some kind of windscreen you know sectors could be a lot of things sector could be road noise so we could have a whole sector of road noise and it's just kind of a way of like plotting out on a map like what the different aspects of your land are sun angles so that pie you know here the sun comes up over here and it sets over here in the spring and then the winter it's a little different you know so you you can map out those and that will help with orientating your house and the windows and things like that so it's just it's really a way of analyzing a piece of land and it just it just gives you an extra layer so the way I kind of work is is I take all these different methodologies and I just kind of like internally start layering them over each other to where they start to make sense and then you're taking that into yourself and then you're able to come up with an efficient design. So analysis is just designing by listing components. You can analyze each component of your farm and that'll really help. Workflow, I mean, I think out of anything almost, workflow could potentially be the most important one. Thinking about this has to come in, the feed has to come into here, and then I have to do this step, and then I have to do this step. And if we don't, you know, take in account workflow, then we're like, we may have our feed over here and have to go over here to do this part, and then we don't have, we've got the table that we need to work off of over here. So it's just, I mean, that's, a, that's just an example, but it's just a way of having that efficient workflow in your life. And I think that that's, that's really important. And I already talked about overlay. Overlay is where you're just overlaying all these different methodologies to come up with a design. This is kind of, this is that overlay and this is, this is bringing it all together. The middle, you know, that, that could be the design or it could be the designer or it could be the designer's thought process you know you're basically this is you and you're bringing in all these different components to make a good design so you have you have the site components that you work with the energy components social and abstract you know the abstract is the timing the ethics things like that social components every um, area has different cultures, you know, that you want to respect that and that plays an important part into the design. So it's really like you standing in the center and designing outward. Nutrient cycle, this whole thing is basically about nutrient cycle. Nutrient cycle is very simple. It basically comes down to water and carbon. I mean, there's a lot more to it. But growing plants on the land, plants are amazing. I mean, who would have thought? Wow. Think about it. Plants soak in carbon, an amazing amount of carbon. Sun and water. So you're basically compounding carbon So with trees, bring in carbon, cover crops, bring in carbon. And then you're collecting water off the landscape. If you could collect as much water as you can off the landscape and off roofs, feeding that back into the carbon cycle, that's how you grow soil and nutrients. So this, the soil is the living part with the biology in it. So it's just, it's a way of thinking about your, your property and bolstering the carbon, bolstering the water, trying to figure out ways to collect water, working with your soil, 
in the biology. Biodynamics was brought to us by Rudolf Steiner. This happened in the 1920s. Biodynamics has slowly starting to establish itself all over the world. I think one of the cool things about biodynamics is seeing the farm as a living organism. So often, you know, we see the farm as pieces that don't really relate together necessarily. But biodynamics really envisions the farm as a living organism. So a living organism has a lot of components to it and it works together. And the real beauty of biodynamics is enlivening the entire farm and have it work together. Enlivening the soil, um, having wetlands, having wooded treeland. Um, really, this whole concept of the farm being able to grow its own fertility instead of bringing off farm fertility. Rudolf Steiner said that, you know, basically to use fertilizers from off farm as a remedy for an unhealthy farm or for a sick farm. So we have the potential now to grow our own fertility on the farm. And that's really what biodynamics is about. And, bio, and I really kind of group biodynamics, Korean natural farming, and compost tea. They all kind of do the same thing in a certain sense. It's all about using, this is why I really love it, it's about using waste products, mostly, that you can get off the farm for virtually free, combining them in a certain way, promoting biology, and growing that biology out, compounding that biology, culturing it and compounding it, and at a certain point mixing it with water and spraying that out. So we're able to take a tiny bit of material, enliven it, add it with water, and then we vastly um, expand its surface area. We grow that, it grows in the water, and then we're able to spray that out. So it's a way for us to uh, really eliminate most of our off-farm inputs. And it's kind of weird. It's like, I don't know if you guys know anything about biodynamics. It's got some weird aspects to it. It's kind of cool, I like that. You see the horns? Basically, you're taking, so there's nine preparations in biodynamics. Um, you're taking, and this is preparation 500. You're mixing, you're putting cow manure in horns. You got that? Burying it over winter in fertile soil, digging it up in spring emptying that cow horn out. And uh, this is kind of what it looks like. It's totally transformed. It's full of biology. And it smells sweet. And this is able to be stirred for an hour in water, back and forth. There's a whole potentization that happens and we spray it out and we're finding incredible um, farm restorations. In Australia, there's millions of acres under biodynamic cultivation. Lots and lots of success stories of building soil where soil didn't exist before, where it was very degraded. Uh, in America, here, it's, I don't know if it's just a cultural thing, if it's, if it's our lack of understanding, or it's just not getting to us, but 
it hasn't really taken off as much. But I think biodynamics holds some really strong keys for the future. Anytime we can make our own fertilizers, you know, and be able to scale up, we can start with the smallest farms, you know, a, uh, an urban farm, we can make our own fertilizers for that or up to as big as we want. I mean, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of acres farms, individual farms that are run with biodynamic principles. So this, I think, holds a lot of, a lot of potential for the future. I was talking about is the potentization and spraying. Basically, with biodynamics, you're mixing in just a little bit of the product into a large quantity of water and you're mixing it. This way you're creating a vortex and then you're mixing it the other way. So you have, you're structuring water one way, you're creating chaos in that water and then you're structuring it the other way. You're gonna uh, mix that for an hour and then spray it out. And you're spraying out, Rio Steiner really talked about forces. I kind of think back in his day you know, this was in the 20s. Microbiology was pretty new. He didn't have a lot of, you know, there weren't a lot of uh, words for what he was tr trying to talk about necessarily. So he was talking forces. I think there are a lot of forces in the biodynamic preparations. There's also, now we know there's lots of life in it. And anytime we can spray out life on our farm, that's when we're really, you know, potential to build out soil really quickly. So I have a few preps here. I'm just gonna pass some around, let you guys check that out. Um, this my brother made, he's in Colorado. And this is horn manure. So check that out. This came out of the horn. Smell it, feel it, touch it if you want. It's, it's sweet and alive. Rudolf Steiner was very esoteric. You know, his worldview of the cow was that the cow is sacred. And all over the world, really, the cow is held to high esteem. It's very sacred, you know, in India and other parts of the world. He really saw the cow as the most advanced um, kind of fermentation and digestion out of all the farm animals. And oddly enough, these horns kind of, the way his thinking was they um, hold back the cow's digestive energies, kind of like their etheric energies from going out. So it's kind of like radiating in. I don't think it has as much to do with the calcium as the shape of the horn. Um, concentrating energy, and this is kind of, this may go too far down this rabbit hole, I don't know, but the, um, we also, we know that the earth breathes in, in the winter, especially carbon, and breathes out in the summer. And there's this rhythmical process that happens. The cow horn, the preps are made, you know, take advantage of that process. So uh, we're burying it in fertile ground. It's theoretically concentrating um, kind of like that winter force and it gets transformed in spring. I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, it works though. Uh, this is barrel compost. So this is a similar product. It really doesn't have a whole lot of smell. It's sweet. It's made with all the preparations inside it. Basically in a barrel, in, a in the ground. They have found that uh, spraying out after Chernobyl happened, Eastern Europe had a lot of radioactive fallout. And the Europeans started testing different farms and the products coming off the farms. And all of a sudden they started seeing these weird things happen where they would test products off a biodynamic farm and they weren't picking up any radiation. And so it's theorized that the barrel compost is in live, the barrel compost and the 500 is really enlivening the soil and is helping the soil transmute radioactivity. 
you know, if that's a big statement, I don't know. But that's, uh, barrel compost has really taken off after that. And it's a way of getting all the preps into the material and spraying them out. If not, you have to take the individual. There's nine preps. I showed you the 500 uh, and the barrel compost. But with the other preparations, you would insert them into a compost pile and then apply that compost to your land. This is a way of kind of stepping up that potentization inside that barrel. You're using manure and you're putting all the preps and then instead of having to directly apply compost, you're potentizing that and spraying it out. So, any questions about that? So you would take that product and mix it in the water? Yeah, you would take that and mix it with water. And that's made in the barrel? That is made in a barrel, yep. Yep, that's in, that's in ground. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is that over winter as well, or just compost? You know, barrel compost doesn't, it, it's, uh, people are making it different times of year. It definitely, when you make it over winter, it's a lot slower to transform. It's green inside. Um, it just takes longer. It could take six months. If you do it in spring or summer, whereas more biology, it's warmer, you know, things speed up a lot quicker. It could happen in three months. So it's not, um, it's not as specific. So Korean natural agriculture is similar to biodynamics, except maybe not quite as esoteric and out there. Korean natural agriculture was developed, it was ha it's been developed since the 1960s. There was a lot of poverty in South Korea and the farmers were looking for a way of increasing their yields, increasing their livelihoods, but without the whole green revolution of buying in chemicals and fertilizers. So Korean natural agriculture really took off. It's very similar to, in some ways, the way that they make kimchi in Korea. It's a, another fermentation process. And it is also similar to biodynamics, as I said before, where it's usually using a lot of waste products or kind of products that are inexpensive and easy to get.